Hello and welcome everybody to another U of Care podcast. My name is Oliver Grundman and it is my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Ali Yurasek, uh, who is with us uh, today. Uh, Ali, would you mind introducing yourself to our audience? Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be a part of this. Um, as you already said, my name is Ali Rasik. Um, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Health, Education, and Behavior at the University of Florida. Awesome. Uh, yeah, you've been in your position since 2016, from what I read uh, on your on your uh, biography on your webpage. Uh, so, uh, what got you interested in the field of addiction research in general? Since this is what brings us all together under the umbrella of U of Care. Right. So it's sort of an interesting story. So as an undergraduate student, um, I actually started off majoring in sports medicine. Um, and, and part of that was you, you shadow different athletic teams and, um, you know, each semester you have a different training um, experience. And so I was first teamed up with the, the football team and you kind of just shadow the athletic trainer. You learn how to wrap ankles and deal with those situations. And the, the team gets used to you. They get used to you being around and um, they kind of forget you're there and they start having these these conversations. And what always stood out to me were the conversations around partying after the game and what they're going to do over the weekend. And you would have almost two sets of, of, of players, if you will. So you would have some who, when they were in season, they were very focused. Um, they really valued their performance and, and doing well. Um, and those are the the players who didn't tend to, to drink or party during the, during the season because um, they were worried of how that might influence their performance or if they were to get in trouble and then they wouldn't be able to, to play. And then you have the other group who didn't really seem to care that much. They were going to party no matter what. Um, and I'm not quite sure what it was about that, that scenario, but there was something that for me just kind of lit a fire of trying to identify, well, if this, for this person, there's something about football that's so valuable that they're going to choose to do well in that particular area rather than make the choice to use substances, which is also reinforcing and an enjoyable thing to do, especially in a college, college setting. Um, and so how, for those who football didn't seem to be the, the activity for them that was going to stop them from using uh, drinking or, or partying over the weekend, what activity was a better fit? So could it be for them, it was if they have a test the next day, they're not going to, to, to drink or go a little bit crazy in terms of um, substance use. So over time, what I realized is that was more interesting to me than um, the athletic training field. Um, um, so I took a, a couple of psychology courses and that's sort of where um, I started figuring out that, okay, if I go this route, I can actually learn more about this. I can study this. I can see um, what are risk factors for certain behaviors, what are protective factors. Um, and that's sort of where it, where it all started. And then um, clinical psychology just seemed like a good fit based on those interests. That is definitely very interesting because if you, if you think about it, uh, there are these positive and negative reinforcers, right? So positive reinforcer could be sport on one end because you get this, this kind of high from uh, the workout itself and then also the achievement that you get from winning a game uh, from, you know, the competition of it, but also the negative reinforcers uh, doing, you know, uh, the, the threat of not doing well on a test. So that would be a negative reinforcer, I would assume. Uh, and then also on the other side, the, the other, uh, other positive reinforcer being having a good time on the weekend partying, mm -hmm. stuff like that, right? Okay. So, uh, wow, that's, that's really interesting what, how, how, what paths we all take that get us yeah. where we are today, <laughs> right? It's, it's really interesting. So based, based on that, uh, when you got into clinical psychology, what then, from, based on that experience that you had as an undergraduate, what got you then into your current work into your current research area? Mm -hmm. Well, it sort of worked out nicely when I, when I got accepted into graduate school, there were a, a, few, um, a few professors who were doing uh, work within the area of, of addiction, whether it was tobacco, drinking, um, but one really stood out to me. His name is Dr. Jim Murphy. He's still doing this, this research, um, but he uses um, behavioral economic theory, and I hadn't heard of that before starting graduate school. 
And that theory just made so much sense to me. And it, it really mapped onto that whole um, undergraduate experience of sort of the, the, the thought process behind the decision to engage in substance use behaviors ver versus these other alternative activities. Um, and so once I started working in, in that lab and getting more familiar with um, that particular theory and getting involved in intervention development work, that all sort of kind of paved the way to where I'm at now, where um, I also had done some clinical work with juvenile justice involved youth and that theory and the interventions we were doing with college students seemed like they could apply to that particular population. They would have to be tweaked and, and adapted, but I kept thinking that it, it would make sense to, to apply it to that um, population and that kind of spurred my um, postdoc research and, and what I'm doing now. So when you say economic, uh, I, I, I'm trying to think of socioeconomic determinants. Does that kind of tie into it? Or is it when you look at it from an economic perspective, purely driven by market forces itself? So it's sort of a combination of, of those factors. And I should have explained that first. So um, behavioral economic theory, it does pull from, from traditional economic theory, but also from um, operant psychology. And um, what it's kind of getting at is that the decision to engage in a certain behavior like substance use is based on how available that activity is, the app, how much access they have, but also how valuable or reinforcing it is. And that will differ for individual. So, um, in general, if you think about college campuses, alcohol is readily available. It's pretty easy to access. There could be a few barriers if you're, you know, underage or if you have a dry campus, but typically it's, it's pretty easy to get. And generally people find it a reinforcing activity. Um, but it, it goes above and beyond that. So behavioral economic theory would suggest that's one part of it. Um, but the decision is also based on what else is available to that person in terms of activities. And, is, and are those activities reinforcing? So whether that's sports, whether that is um, academics, um, leisure activities, physical activity, whatever it might, um, might be. And so if there's access to those things, they're, they're easy to get, they're available, and the person finds them reinforcing, they may choose that activity over um, substance use. And they do measure it by looking at like, um, they can look at money, for example. So how much money would you be willing to, to spend on these different activities to try to get at how valuable they are? Um, but that's sort of one way of explaining it, I guess. That is definitely very interesting because, I mean, when, when you think of alcohol consumption or the availability of alcohol, let's take a, a, another drug like marijuana, which we would still consider an illegal substance, you know, depending on the state you're in, um, and you compare that to investing into a gym membership or something else like a, 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 you know, a leisure activity or doing sports or even investing into your own education as a degree, you, we would not necessarily equalize those as an investment, right? We would, right. wouldn't say that investing in a bottle of whiskey is anywhere close or the same as investing in a gym membership or investing in your education. Mm -hmm. But if you think about, there are also different time horizons, right? So drinking, the, the benefits of drinking happen pretty quickly. So you have a few drinks, you start feeling good, you're maybe a little bit more talkative, more, um, you're, you feel more comfortable in a setting. Um, that happens pretty quickly. A gym membership or, you know, studying for an exam, it's not necessarily that fun in, in the moment. Now, I know some people who love physical activity will argue with me, but it's usually something that's rewarding over time. So the first time you run a mile, it's horrible. Over time, that's going to get more and more reinforcing, but that takes a while. Whereas the choice to drink right now and feel good right now, that's um, a choice that can be sometimes easier to make rather than thinking about do I want to have fun right now or do I want to spend my time, you know, working out or, you know, take an hour to study for this hard exam? Um, and so it depends on the salience that the person will put on those different activities. And, and it can fluctuate. We can change that. And that's what I like to do with interventions is how can we, you know, shrink that time horizon a little bit to make them more equal. But. 
So when, when, when I think about this, uh, we are living in a society or today more so than maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, where we're looking for a faster reward or a faster feedback to when we are seeking feedback to a, a quiz that we're taking or any activity that we're doing that where feedback is requested or where a reward can be expected. Uh, and that applies to academia, I think, in the same manner like to, to high school activities or many other activities of daily living where uh, we expect customer service to be like instant uh, and, you know, chat and all of that stuff. Uh, email is expected to be almost like an instant messaging system and all of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> this, this kind of, you know, highly connected society. Uh, so... Wouldn't it then be that actually drugs are much more desired by today's, by, by let's say a younger generation? I think they can be for sure. I think that's one of the, the problems that we're seeing is how technology has changed people's ability to wait for delayed outcomes and delayed rewards um, and how it changes the, the way our brain is actually wired and how we expect and anticipate things. So there are studies to suggest that people who do have a harder time waiting or who have um, less of an ability to kind of uh, wait for that delayed reward tend to um, be a little bit more at risk to enjoy substances and, and like them and maybe use them to, to risky, risky levels. Um, I mean, we're all at some point, the farther a reward gets away, the, the, the worse we all, all are at that. To, to some extent, but some people, there are individual differences in people's ability to, to do so, and they do tend to be more at risk. Yeah, I'm definitely like that with Haribo gummy bears. If you put them in front <laughs> of me, they will be gone within five minutes. But let, let's turn to your research and what kind of implications does your work actually, what do you see what kind of implications your work have on the current life of, especially when you when you look at uh, your current work involving marijuana and uh, how will it implicate, uh, for example, college students and the like? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's sort of twofold. So I think on the one hand, we have, and, and you alluded to this, that our, our laws are, are changing, right? So some states, both medical and recreational marijuana um, is, is available. Um, and so the research really right now is, is pretty mixed on how those laws are influencing actual use and for what populations might be most at, at risk. But if you think about it from this kind of behavioral economic perspective, again, when things are, are legal, there's easier access to them, right? Um, and so there's, if you use that theory, then um, you might predict that these laws are going to make uh, or potentially increase marijuana use for certain populations. And, and some studies do show that and others um, don't. And part of the problem, I think, in studying that is each, each state has different ways of doing it. They have different rules for how much is acceptable, what ways you can use it, um, how many dispensaries and where those are. So it's really hard to, to kind of study. Um, so I think, and my research in this area is relatively uh, new for, for me, um, and so we're still working on, on that data, but I think if there's a potential implication from that work um, that might guide future policies or how physicians might consider recommending um, medical marijuana, um, but for me, it's so, it's so new, I'm not quite sure um, where it could go, but those are some possible implications. Um, but the other end of my research is looking at um, sort of interventions for marijuana use for, um, especially for adolescents, um, because for, for them, their brains are still developing. And so there is sort of a, a risk for them using, um, especially when they're using at, at high levels. These are just for, for generally healthy children who are using recreationally. Um, I think there's implications for my research to help improve our interventions in that area, um, whether it's adapting current interventions, um, figuring out um, what we should be targeting, um, but also how we can implement them to make, we, we do a lot of research in, and they seem the interventions do really well in a lab controlled setting, um, but we need to do more, I think, of implementation work 
So that's what I'm hoping to do with um, my current project is see if it works at all and then figure out how to implement it so that um, the people who need it will have access to it in like a school setting, for example. So this would be really practically applicable, not only to a clinical psychology population, but also to directly, let's say, teachers or even parents in a in in a setting that would be outside of the the the, the pure clinical setting where you are practicing. Yeah. Within that setting only. Yeah, and I tend to do more um, what's called kind of brief interventions that are um, usually you know one to two sessions long, only about an hour, and. And even though you know there's there's some evidence that the longer and more you do could potentially be better, there's also the side of this population can be hard to reach and they don't have the time to come meet with you every single week or they don't have transportation. And so this is a way to kind of get in there, um, do a few um, interventions, but also these are interventions that can be easily, um, you can easily train people to do it. They don't need a clinical psych degree um, to do this necessarily. So um, those who are willing or want to learn how to do this in a school setting could be, could be trained, ideally. So in finishing up this interview, I've asked uh, all of the other folks that I had the pleasure to, to do a podcast with, what do you think is the biggest challenge that you are facing as a researcher within the addiction research space and the community and, and society at large related to substance use disorders and addiction today? So I, I'm hopeful that this is a, a temporary challenge, but um, when I first read that, that question, what stood out to me the most is this COVID-19 um, pandemic, um, both for the research side of things, but also for, I think, society as, as a whole. Um, and I guess what I mean by that is, and again, I base everything off of this, this behavioral economic theory. It really guides my thinking. And if we think about that theory, um, when this pandemic hit, there was a pretty sudden, quick removal of kind of natural barriers to substance use, if that makes sense. So for a period of time, people weren't able to go to work. Some people lost their jobs completely. Um, school was, was canceled and, and how it was conducted was, was changed. And those changes influence the structure of how things are, are done. Um, and so these natural like costs to using substances have, have decreased. Um, and I guess a better example of this, if you think about our jobs, and again, you know, we're so lucky that we're able to work from home, um, but pre-COVID, you and I might have been on campus doing something like this, um, or I would definitely have been in, in my office, which really decreases the likelihood that I'm going to be drinking a glass of wine at 1 p.m. On, on a Wednesday. Um, whereas in this setting, I promise you I'm not drinking a glass of wine, but it's a lot easier in this setting for me to be drinking right now um, rather than if I was at, at work. Um, I think we're seeing that in other areas. So after school activity, and again, this is all for the, the social isolation and um, kind of the temporary halting of, of activities. We're all done for for a reason. So I'm not against. I'm not saying anything bad about that. I'm just sort of saying that with that comes these other consequences that are, I think, um, kind of the a ripe environment for increasing substance use. Um, and along those lines, people are kind of socially isolating, which we know impacts mood. Um, if people have lost a loved one to this or they've lost their jobs, um, we are, and I think the data is suggesting that we're seeing increases in depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, all of which can influence um, substance use. And at the same time, even though our activities are shifting and what we can do and what we're able to do, are, those are decreasing, our access to substance use really hasn't decreased all that much. And in some situations, it might even be easier to get. Now we can have wine delivered right to our door. We can do takeout at restaurants where we get the margarita to go. And so um, maybe not in every single case, but we don't have to get you know, dressed. We don't have to get in the car to go. It can just come straight to, to our door. So activities that normally would um, make us less likely to use substances are being kind of removed or they're temporarily canceled, whereas access hasn't changed. So I think that was a long-winded way of saying, I think, um, the COVID-19 situation is right now our biggest challenge in terms of um, increasing the, 
the likelihood of using substances. Yeah, this uh, definitely the, the COVID-19 situation, I think, uh, illustrates very well under, under what kind of conditions human behavior is impacted and uh, highlights kind of uh, how, uh, how we can all be uh, susceptible, let's say that way, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to one, for, for one uh, thing, um, uh, potentially uh, depressive behaviors. Uh, I think that an anxiety uh, being confined to spaces, not knowing what's coming next, and then also obviously the the excess removing barriers to excess or uh, social norms kind of are getting kind of diluted as you as you alluded to. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of research potentially also uh, in your space coming that uh, COVID nineteen will will show us how behaviors might be uh, fluctuating or changing during this during this time period, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think just as researchers being creative and how we how we handle that, um, you know, like the way I wanted to do my intervention was in, in person. And so I'll probably have to change that to more of a virtual um, inter intervention. So I think just being creative and, and adaptive and, you know, how can we come up with activities that are just as reinforcing um, as they, they were before, even if they look and feel a little bit different in this time. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much you. You, for, for your time. Uh, uh, well, luckily, since we conduct all of the interviews via Zoom, we were always prepared for COVID-19. So yeah. <laughs> uh, this, this is not going to change, change this. Uh, but I really appreciate you taking the time uh, today. Uh, and uh, for everybody else for listening, this was certainly very interesting. Uh, and uh, I really look forward uh, to new research coming out of your lab out of your group out of uh, out of what you generate because it will certainly impact our knowledge uh, about uh, marijuana and alcohol use and especially how adolescents are influenced by that thank you very much thank you for having me okay everybody have a good day and see you on the next podcast bye, bye.